Hello, everyone. Welcome to the last session of System at Skill 2021 Summer Edition. My name is Yun. I'm the host for the event. In the past three weeks, we start with the topic of reliability, which is an important theme across all the systems. Uh, we move to resource management layer, then focus on storage systems. You are welcome to check out the videos for all those great presentations. Today, we will close the event with another important aspect for all the systems, which is performance. In college, uh, my professor told me that performance starts with profiling. When it comes to profiling or observability, an exciting development in recent years is BPF. Our first speaker today is Brandon Gregg from Netflix. He will share experience about how to use BPF to get performance wins. Let's welcome Brandon. G'day and welcome to Performance Wins with BPF. My name is Brendan Gregg. I'm a performance engineer at Netflix, and I'm now based out of Sydney, Australia. In fact, I'm the first engineer to be based out of Sydney, so I think I'll claim the title of Head of Netflix Engineering for Sydney. Now, BPF is an exciting new topic. It is a bytecode, it is a kernel execution environment, and it is also a programming language. Now, if you want to learn a programming language, a lot of people will start with Hello World. This happens from time to time at Netflix where I'll get sent a message in chat where an engineer has hit these BPF verify errors or IR, LVM IR errors, and they'd like my help with it. Great, I can help you out. So I'm looking at them and it's like, wow, you're deep into the internals of BPF. What is it that you're doing? And at that point, the engineers say, well, I'm trying to fix some performance issues and I heard that BPF was useful. Oh no, with performance issues, we have all these canned tools. If you're starting with writing code, you are starting at the hard way. And so that's what this talk is about, is to help you get performance wins with BPF the easy way. Now, if you type a search for getting started with BPF, the problem is a lot of this documentation that you'll find was true in 2015, but it's not so much true today because BPF has evolved, we've added tools, and we've added new front ends. And this screenshot I've decorated it with, I've crossed things out, things I wish you wouldn't look at if you're a beginner because the first hit, that article is not for beginners, the third hit, that's not really the best start, then that one's out of date and so on. So many of these docs were true in 2015 so you should look at the dates of BPF documentation that you encounter. But another problem is newcomers keep reposting this old information as new. And so it happened in June 2021. I've seen an article about BPF observability, and it's based on the old material. This is based on 2015. And so as a leader of BPF observability, there's nothing I can do to stop people from posting old content. What I can do, and is what I'm doing right now, is I want to tell you how to start with BPF in this talk. Also, if you search for what is BPF itself, that's even more confusing. Many of the hits talk about what the acronym originally stood for, which was Berkeley Packet Filter. But nowadays, BPF is a bytecode and execution environment, and we don't think of it as an acronym anymore. It is a technology name, similar to LLVM and other things as well. We sometimes call it eBPF, where eBPF is for extended BPF. Now, this talk is about how to get quick and easy performance wins with BPF. And the trick is to think like a sysadmin and not like a programmer. As a sysadmin, I used to be a system administrator at the start of my career, and my job was to get all the software that my company needed installed and working so people can use it. And you can do that with BPF. So apt get installed, the BCC tools, or it might be called BCC BPF tools. And then from your path, you can then run all of these different tools, exec snoop, open snoop, TCP life, and immediately start solving performance issues. Now I've listed the top five tools that you can use for BPF performance wins. So the first is exec snoop. This helps you see if anything is running. And you might be surprised how many performance wins I've found just by running exec snoop. 
where there's some cron tab process that's running or there's um, some build is running in the background, some activity that we've forgotten about, and that's perturbing the performance of the production environment. A classic, I actually see at Netflix a lot, is that we have a service that tries to run something, and if the configuration file is incomplete, it will, in a shell script, sleep for a second and then keep launching programs every second trying to get this thing up and running. Now, in production, your production application is running. Meanwhile, this thing is launching these failing processes every second. And so that's easily identified by running ExacSnoop. OpenSnoop is another great BPF observability tool that can help you find misconfigurations, such as file not found. TCP Life is a, a tool I wrote to show the TCP sessions that are happening. And you can see the duration, the IP addresses, port numbers, bytes transferred. And that's been built into many other solutions for doing network monitoring. ext 4 slow for looking at file system I.O. It's much better than beginning to look at disk I.O. since file systems is where the application feels the pain. And then BioSnoop for looking at unusual disk access patterns directly at the disks to fully understand the storage I.O. stack. Now, as a case study, so you can see how some of these tools fit together, this was a Cassandra performance issue I debugged. And the IOSTAT output showed that the disks were at 50, about 10 to 20% utilized, and there was a light workload. Now, normally you'd look at this and you'd think, well, it's probably not the disk. There's a Cassandra database issue. I should go look somewhere else. But with the BPF tools, I ran BioSnoop. That's in my top five. And then the output shows that the Perl command was issuing a lot of disk reads, type read. Now, as it turns out, I'm a big fan of Perl. I love Perl programming. But I didn't know that the Cassandra database was written in Perl. That's pretty cool. Actually, I don't think the Cassandra database is written in Perl. The Cassandra database is written in Java. So this is something else is running on the system that's causing a disk read workload, and that's likely perturbing that target. And if you think about, if you find a Perl program at Netflix that's perturbing a target, there's a reasonable chance that I wrote the Perl program because there's only a few of us writing Perl at Netflix. So this could be my, my own fault. PS minus EF, grep for Perl. Phew, that's someone else. That's EC2 rotate logs. So that's a tool we have that will rotate the instance logs. It had gone haywire on this instance and it had launched several copies of it. And that was causing all this disk I.O. And that was perturbing the Cassandra database. So very simple case study. It's using a mixture of the, just to go back to some slides, this is the Unix tool IOSTAT on Linux to look at the disk metrics. And then I'm using a BPF tool to dig down further and get more clues on what the problem is. And then back to PS. And there's the issue. It's easy to rotate logs. I can check out that configuration. There are many more tools to try. So this diagram, I've drawn a generic kernel and operating system, and I've decorated it with all of the BPF observability tools with arrows to show what they're instrumenting. In red, new observability tools I wrote for my BPF book, and these are all open source, so you can run them all. This diagram really explains why we're so excited about BPF observability. And this is another thing about if you try and learn this online, there's a lot of articles that talk about BPF programming and capabilities and this and that. That's not, not why I'm excited about BPF observability. This is why I'm excited about BPF observability. It's because I can solve all these issues that I can't solve with other tools. I created many of these tools out of necessity because I wanted to understand performance inside the scheduler or inside TCP or inside file systems. This is why BPF observability is so important because these tools help you solve performance issues. And that's really, really the point of all of this. It's solving performance issues and helping out your company. The goal of BPF is not to write programs. It's about those, the actual realizing value from the technology. Now, you can actually use this diagram as a checklist. You can print it out and put it on your office wall. And then if you have, say, a disk issue, you could start with the disk tools. 
So they have circled them. We've got biotop, biosnoop, biolatency, and tried to run them to see if there's anything unusual. And then you can walk up the stack. So this is showing, if I go up the stack, I've got volume management tools, file system tools, VFS tools, and that's showing the same IO, but from different layers. And it's actually, if you're looking at disk IO, you do need to look at files, the file system as well, because it's the file system that the applications talk to, and it's the file system that is a better measure of pain. Because the file system can do read ahead, it can do write back buffering, it can do all sorts of things so that the application doesn't experience slow disk IO. And so that's why it's important to measure from the file system. But this diagram, it gives you that path, it gives you the starting point, and then I can work around the stack and figure out my performance issue using this great variety of tools. Now, people like me will do that. So I will log in to instances over SSH and I'll run these tools and I'll have a great time. But for a lot of us, you don't have that much time to analyze performance. You're in a hurry. And I think the future for most people is really dashboards in GUIs. And a colleague, Susie at Netflix, she's been working on this GUI for BPF and BPF Trace. And so you can then click on a CPU report and it runs the main tools for CPU analysis, BPF tools, and gives you a report. You can do the same for disks, file systems, scheduler activity, and so on. And then the information is right there. And we link to this straight from our Spinnaker cloud deployment application. So for a lot of you, I think this is really how you'll end up consuming BPF. It's going to be the GUIs that are built up on top of these tools just to make it easier to launch them and browse the output and visualize the output as well. So it's not always text. Here's an example of building a real-time BPF observability UI. And this is how Netflix Vector, our first BPF UI was built. On the servers themselves, they would run an instance agent. In that example, it was Performance Copilot's PMDA BCC. And that would launch BCC tools. BCC is one of the BPF front ends. The client UI, you would load the, it was called Netflix Vector. You'd load Vector from a web server within Netflix. It would load that UI code. And then the client UI would connect to the instance agents, which would launch the tools. And then the client UI would render the output. It's a very simple model. It doesn't have persistent storage, but you could add persistent storage, no problem. We're actually moving to a new model that Susie's working on, and this is where the BPF trace tools are stored on the web server. And so they're stored as text, and then the client UI sends their BPF trace tools to the servers it's monitoring, which then goes and runs them. This gives us more flexibility and also helps so that when we don't have out of date tools on all of the servers. So we just have to update the tools in one place on the web server and they get pushed out as required. This thing is called Netflix Flame Commander. We haven't open sourced it yet. When you're building these things, I would also encourage you to please think like a sysadmin and build upon the existing tools and fetch regular updates. So I do see startups and other people thinking more like a programmer and they begin by rewriting these tools that we have and the BCC BPF libraries that we have in the programming language of their choice. And sometimes it's fine to rewrite things. I've created flame graph software before. People have rewritten it a whole heap of times. I don't see a big problem with that. But there is a problem with the BPF tools in that many of them, they instrument kernel internals. And so they require frequent maintenance and rebuilding by the kernel engineers to ensure that they're working. And I have seen cases where startups have taken my tools and ported them and they're not getting updates. And so it's a, it's a bit frustrating to see end users, customers are getting a, a worse experience with BPF because they're now on effectively an older port of these tools and they're not consuming them from mainline. So please try to look at ways to build upon the existing tools like we're doing at Netflix. And bear in mind, these tools are maintained by lots of companies in Facebook does a lot of work on BCC and BPF Trace. We do at Netflix and many other companies as well. So sysadmin sometimes program, but instead of just installing things, we use shell scripting, awk, and said one-liners. How that translates into the world of BPF is BPF Trace tools and BPF Trace one-liners. So there are times when you do want to think like a programmer, 
And that's where you have a real world problem that the tools don't solve. You're a BPF based startup and you need to build a product. Like I said, it'd be great if you could build upon the tools. You're debugging your own code, so you need something completely custom, or you're doing other things that aren't BPF observability, like networking and security. And also, maybe you really want to learn BPF internals. If you are going to think like a programmer, the recommended tracing front ends are BCC and BPF trace. BCC we created first, and the main front ends for that are Python and what's called libbpf, and libbpf is C. And so we're now able to write these very small C programs in BCC. BPF Trace is a high level language and it's great for prototyping or hacking up new tools. If you actually want to spend weeks developing a BPF product, then that's when you'll code in BCC, libbpfc, you'll maybe code in BCC, Python, Go BPF, and so on. But this is why I wanted to have this talk because I see people beginning here. They're new to BPF and they're, they're looking at all this. BCC Python code, or they're looking at this BCC libbpfc code, you should start by running the tools if you have a performance issue, and hopefully they'll solve them for you. And then if you want to hack up new tools, check out BPF Trace, and only get into the programming if you have to. If it seems like there's too many front ends, it is similar in Unix. So we have user bin starts. So you've got tools like LS and Bash, you don't write them, you just use them, they already exist. And so that's why there's all these tools in these collections in BCC and BPF Trace. If you want to hack up new tools, sure, there's Bash and Org to do that. And if you want to spend weeks developing a product, C and C++. So it seems a bit like there's too, too many things in BPF, but it is similar for Unix or Linux anyway. A BPF trace example, I've mentioned BPF trace. I said it's a higher level language. Here's an example tool I created called Readahead. And for a long time, I've done file systems performance for a long time, and I've wanted some visibility into how well Readahead is working. Is it polluting the caches? Are we actually reading the pages that, that the file system is reading? Or, or is it not tuned enough? Do we need to tune it more aggressively? And so the output of this tool shows the used page age, the time between when Reader had prefetched a page into the cache to when the application actually used it. And I can see in this case, it's pretty quick. It's between one and 32 milliseconds. So it seems like Reader Head is working fine here. Maybe I want to tune that a bit more aggressively. Now what's great about BPF Trace is that tool fits on one slide. That's the entire tool. Now I won't go through the code, but I'm just making the point that this is a higher level language. And if you want to start with programming and hacking, it's a great place to start. I mentioned libbpf, that's the new interface in BCC, and it lets us create these standalone BPF programs that have the BPF bytecode embedded inside them. What's amazing is these libbpf tools can be run on different kernel versions because of BTF, which is BPF type format, a kernel technology, and core, compile once run everywhere, Facebook has done this work so that the tools themselves have relocatable information inside the BPF bytecode so they can find out where struct members are for different kernel versions. And so the end result is I might have a 150 kilobyte program, which is BPF, and it works on different kernel versions. It's awesome. So this is a future for running these agents, and the libbpf tools are in BCC. In the future, there'll just be an apt get install, libbpf tools, and it's going to be some small binaries that just work. And we don't have to have the heavyweight dependencies like LLVM. Config debug info BTF is required for this wonderful new world to work. And we've had good success convincing distros to turn it on. So it's on in Ubuntu, Fedora, and Red Hat. In the future, BPF lets us create these event-based applications. It's not just observability, but the fact that when an event fires, you can run some custom code. It's a different model for software, unlike user mode applications or kernel mode applications. And I've drawn this table to explain the differences between BPF and user and kernel mode. And with BPF, the resource access is better than user mode software because you're running inside the kernel. It's not direct like the kernel, direct function calls, but it's pretty close. But then if you look at the other attributes for kernel code, BPF is much better. You get better error messages, you get better security, compilation is, has improvements for performance, and it's user-defined. So it's like a safer, more secure way of writing kernel applications. 
that has pretty good access to resources, so it's pretty fast. Another way to think of it is if you're developing software, kernel mode software, and you'd like Netflix to run it as a third party company, we'd much prefer it was BPF because we have security assurances for that code. So the takeaway for BPF performance wins is to think like a sysadmin and not like a programmer. And your first task is to please install BCC in the BPF trace tools. By default at many companies, including Netflix and Facebook, they're already in the server instances. So you, you just need to find the path for where these tools are run them, and then get some wins. And that's really what this is about. It's about using BPF to do, to solve issues for your company. For references, I've got a list in the slides. And recently I have published two books that get into BPF and systems performance in a lot of detail. BPF performance tools, which had all the extra tools I wrote and systems performance second edition. And thank you very much for watching my talk. And thanks to everyone who have helped create BPF that we're using today in production at Netflix from the BPF communities, BCC, and BPF Trace. I hope that BPF finds you some amazing performance wins and you get to save your company millions of dollars. Thank you.